The fragile humanitarian pause between Israel and Hamas collapsed today after negotiations reached an impasse. Publicly, Israel and Hamas blamed each other for military activity that violated the week-long pause. The Israeli military has now urged residents in parts of southern Gaza to evacuate, signaling that a broader assault is coming. It's not clear where Gaza residents in the south would evacuate to. A total of 178 Palestinians have been killed and 589 injured in Gaza since the resumption of hostilities today, according to the Gaza Health Ministry. The Health Ministry also says the IDF is targeting al adwa al Auda Hospital and is calling for U.N. protection. The fighting resumed after a bombshell report that Israel knew of the Hamas attack plan more than a year ago. A blueprint reviewed by The New York Times laid out the attack in detail, but Israeli officials dismissed it as aspirational and ignored specific warnings. Joining me now is journalist and foreign policy expert Rula Jabril. And Rula, this was a stunning uh, piece of journalism. Uh, and just for a little bit, it, this 40-page document, which the Israeli authorities codenamed Jericho Wall, described a, meth a methodical assault designed to overwhelm the fortifications around the Gaza Strip, check, take over Israeli cities and storm key military bases, which actually happened as well, including a division headquarters. They hit the military base. They went to civilian areas, took hostages. It's all in this this report that was a year old, your take on how and why it could have been ignored? Well, this goes back to Bibi Netanyahu's governing philosophy. For 30 years, he told Israelis that he's the only one can keep them safe. He's the only one that can thwart, prevent the establishment of Palestinian state. And he's the only one that can control the Americans. He keep reiterating those things until last week, I believe. And the central part, I can prevent a Palestinian state by basically, and this is the most important element, by strengthening Hamas and delegitimizing, discrediting the Palestinian Authority. I mean, 10 years ago, when he started negotiating with Hamas and lobbying Gulf state to finance Hamas, he released the head of Hamas today in Gaza, Yahya Sinwar. Yahya Sinwar is the architect of this attack. He was in Israeli jail, not because he killed Israelis, but because he killed Palestinians. He thought that Hamas did not represent a, a military threat anymore. And thus, he took from Gaza all the a lot of units and took them back to the West Bank, undermining the security of the border, took them to the West Bank because his ultimate goal was annexation of the Palestinian territories. It goes back to his governing philosophy. A lot of Israelis like myself, citizens, feel betrayed by this government. All of his life, he told us that he could keep Israelis safe. And under his watch, the worst terrorist attack took place. And now he's doubling down on the same policies that produce nothing but death and destruction. Yeah, the death toll is now over 14,000. And then if you count the additional deaths uh, from the bombing that has resumed, th this is one thing that I don't understand. What we have seen actually proved is that when the bombing stops, Israeli hostages and other hostages from around the world, from Thailand and others, go free. When the bombing is happening, none of that happens at all. Let me play for you Udi Gorin, whose cousin was kidnapped after attempting to fight um, Hamas. Uh, militants came into his kibbutz. MSNB, his, his cousin is still missing. Here's what he had to say today about the resumption of bombing. We are operating under the assumption that we are running out of time. You've just covered the, the renewed assault on southern Gaza. This is yeah. probably where my cousin is. This is where mm -hmm. his phone was traced to. We know that the Israeli airstrikes are hurting the hostages. And now it's even more dense. It, it, it's, it's impossible. What would be the reason to resume bombing when it doesn't help get hostages out, it's hurting Israel's and the United States' reputation, and it isn't an effective way to do anything other than kill a lot of people, including children? Well, Bibi Netanyahu understand that his political life, his survival, his political survival depend on what's happening with the war. Once the music ends, his political life is over. Uh, Israelis, I believe, only 4 percent trust him. At this point, only 4%. And what's keeping him alive is the global unconditional support, especially of the West. When President Biden, the bear hug, uh, continued to deliver weapons without any condition, this actually emboldened these extremists in the government. 
I believe that Bibi Netanyahu and his far-right government will not stop in Gaza. They've been pointing to say, they've been saying that the West Bank, there's two million terrorists and two million Nazis who are being living in the West Bank. They're now creating a doctrine that is so dangerous to Israelis, Palestinians, to the Americans, everywhere. And the doctrine is the following, that Palestinians, all of them, somehow they are either terrorists or terrorist sympathizers or human shields, and thus they are a legitimate target anywhere. They're looking at the northern you know, border in Lebanon saying, well, we will go also to Lebanon because Lebanon has Hezbollah and thus it's a threat. So the West, instead of putting conditions, clear condition to what Israel, the, to comply with international law or American law, they're giving them a green light to continue uh, dismantling Palestinians in Gaza. Today, according to Israel Hayom, a main newspaper in Israel, their ultimate goal is to thinning out the population in Gaza, meaning we need to push them out of the country and bomb them and create. They've been even pinning up at saying, we will use further weapons like, you know, food and water to create a pandemic so we can kill, you know, create a mass mass killing and, and kill them either directly and indirectly. I mean, this is ethnic cleansing. And the fact that President Biden and the administration is aiding and abetting Bibi Netanyahu, who is Donald Trump of Israel, and then not realizing that this is so dangerous for the United States yeah. is astonishing. Joy, one last thing, and, and this is really, if you look at the global south and how the global yeah. south is reacting, we are in uncharted territories. This will enable extremists. We're already having yeah. extremists in Israel, in the government, mm -hmm. saying we cannot survive and we cannot be safe, and this is a nuclear right. state, with the presence of the Palestinians. The next wow. person um, or the next terrorist or tyrant who will use this will be somebody else yeah. who will point out to President Biden backing of Bibi Netanyahu say, if right. Israel did it, we're allowed to do it. Uh, Rula Jabril, I wish we had more time. Uh, scary stuff, but I think important information. Rula Jabril, thank you very much. Today is World AIDS Day, a global movement to unite people in the fight against HIV and AIDS. World AIDS Day was first declared by the World Health Organization in 1988, the year at least 10,000 people died of AIDS in the United States. Tens of millions of people have died of AIDS-related causes since the beginning of the epidemic. The HIV landscape looks a lot different now than it did in the 1980s, but the fight is far from over. In 2022, 39 million people globally were living with HIV, and 1.3 million people were newly diagnosed which is why the people and organizations on the front lines of fighting HIV AIDS say there is still so much more work to be done. And joining me now is Emmy, Grammy, and Golden Globe winning choreographer, director, and producer, the great and glorious Debbie Allen. She is also an HIV AIDS awareness activist and will be speaking tonight at the nation's largest World AIDS Day commemoration, which is a concert in Houston. I'm so jealous I'm not going to be there. Featuring the one and only Janet Jackson. I'm so jealous and I'm so honored to talk to you. This is why I love my job. I get to meet amazing people like you. Debbie Allen, welcome. Thank you so much. You're so beautiful and you have so much joy as you should. I <laughs> oh my. Well, tell me about this amazing event. I, again, definitely wish I could be there, but please tell us why, uh, why is it happening? What is going to happen? Uh, who's going to be a part of it? Give us all the details. Well, AIDS Healthcare Foundation has become the world's largest and leading AIDS uh, organization, nonprofit. It started out as a, a group of friends that were trying to create hospice and help their friends die in a very respectful, dignified way. And now it is the leader. And Michael Weinstein, who is the CEO and president, has made this a commitment to bring awareness so people don't forget. Sometimes people think the battle is over because now it's not a death sentence like it was back in the 80s. I lost half of my dance company on fame. My young men, I was in the hospital. I was pregnant with my baby. And uh, I was in the hospital saying goodbye to my daughter, my uh, famed sons. And that's a painful thing to live with. But now there's so much help and there's so much possibility. And people are living productive, healthy, 
normal lives that are infected with the virus. And people need to just remember that it's still out there. This is a battle that we haven't won yet. It's still a war. And women are high at risk. And so this concert tonight with Janet Jackson is to celebrate all the gains that we've made, all that we have uh, learned and all the medications and the new uh, ways of living, and also to celebrate those who have gone before us. We did one in the and in New York one year, the Apollo, where we celebrated all the great, great dancers that have gone on uh, because of the AIDS virus. And uh, this is a tremendous undertaking, and it's something that's very serious, but joyful at the same time, because this is a celebration. This is a celebration because people can live now. They don't have to die. Yeah. You know, it, 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 it's interesting because there was so, so much that was a, a huge dichotomy in the 1980s. Obviously, we were all watching fame and enjoying you uh, and, and learning about dance and like, learning about the arts. But it was a time of, you know, I remember being in New York and you would see people walking down the street. It would almost like you're seeing people who you could see were dying in front of you. It was a frightening era and sort of a, a glorious era for the arts. We have come a long way, but I want to you mentioned some of these statistics. Although African-Americans represent almost 13 percent of the U.S. population, African-Americans today still account for 42.1 percent of HIV infection cases in 2019. In 2020, African-Americans were 7.8 times more likely to be diagnosed with HIV infection as compared to the white population. Talk about how these disparities can still be happening when, as you said, we have so many drug therapies, so much that has uh, gotten better. Well, it says a lot about the bureaucracy that happens in our country, in the medical profession, in politics, what, what uh, areas and communities are important. And we just have to stand up and say it out loud. There are disparities. There were disparities with the COVID-19. There were disparities all over. So this is not something new to us, but it's something that we have to speak out about and have great awareness of. You know, this weekend we're going to be celebrating Dion Warwick at the Kennedy Center Honors, and she was one of the greatest advocates with that amazing song, That's What Friends Are For, she and all the yes. great legendary Elton John and people that got together. But even when they raised millions of dollars, it was the black community that was not receiving the care that they needed. And Dion took many steps to change that. And the perception. Yeah. The perception is a learned phenomenon. It's not something that is just a, this is what it, you see it and that's what it is, you know. The yeah. Earth used to look flat to the world and it, we know that it's yeah. round. So yeah. we have to keep educated. That's why AIDS Healthcare Foundation is such an important organization and that we're having yeah. this great moment with Janet that we're talking with you right now. There's a cause yeah. for people's ears and eyes to be alert and looking and hearing this. Well, uh, I am alert and hearing and looking and uh, loving you, Ms. Debbie Allen. You are such a legend. And then you said Dion Warwick. I got goosebumps because legends, legends all. Debbie Allen, thank you for all that you do. Thank you for being here with us tonight. Thank you for speaking with us and God bless the world. Thanks.